Hello, and welcome back to Psych 300. Um, today's lecture, we're going to talk about the origins of brain and behavior. Uh, we'll specifically focus on evolution and the larger context of how that occurred across many spe uh, different species and the evolution of the brain. Then we'll look more specifically at human evolution, talking about how uh, the evidence that we have and the changes in behavior we see with this different occurrence and some theories of why certain factors uh, happened and how they may have uh, have a human uh, may have evolved. And then we'll try to link brain and behavior. This will really set the context for some of our next series of lectures talking about the neural anatomy we see in humans as well as some of the functioning of these units in the brain, the central nervous systems, uh, the neuron. So let's go, get, go ahead and get started. Um, I always like to start off brain and behavior with a little bit of a discussion about why study brain and behavior. Why is it important? And this is a, a recent, semi-recent paper that I think really draws in a lot of the topics that we'll be covering over the course. Um, specifically, I think we study brain and behavior because we want to improve people's health. We want to improve people's uh, sense of independence and after a certain brain trauma has occurred. And this study looks at trying to improve or uh, look at, demonstrate that we can get a brain-computer interface to work with people that might be paralyzed from the neck down or have tetraplegia. Uh, basically what they did is they implanted a small electrode array, that's what this is down here, looks like a bunch of needles, and just at the tip, which you can see here, is where it could record from neurons, and this is a um, MRI scan here of the brain showing where this was placed, that little gray square shows where it's placed, and just to give you a little context of how big this electrode array is, here's a penny, and we see its connection there. And then that was placed there, uh, that was placed in a certain part of the brain, uh, the somatosensory motor uh, cortex area. And here is the individual that was uh, had the um, tetraplegia or is paralyzed from the neck down with the recording device located up here. Now, what they had to do is try to record from the activity of the brain. We're going to talk about part of the communication system in the central nervous system is both electrical and chemical. So they were trying to record from that electrical uh, aspects of the central nervous system while this person was watching a computer monitor that had a cursor on it. And the computer then had to learn. Uh, computers can be programmed to learn. Maybe you've heard of Watson, the computer that played Jeopardy, and it was able to uh, learn the relationship between the answers and the questions is so typical for Jeopardy. Well, computers can also learn about these neural signals that are coming from the brain. And over time, what was able to occur is that this person was able to generate certain signal signals in that part of the brain. The computer was able to learn about them and associate them with moving a cursor on a screen in a certain direction. And I have a small video I'd like to show you that kind of demonstrates that. I'll also put this video in uh, Blackboard so that you can see, uh, you can open up and play it for yourself. But here is the video. So you can see here in the center there's a green circle. And then the task is moving the circle to the outside in the correct direction. And so here, just from here, it might be hard to see. But you can see the recording device <clears throat> on the skull of the individual. And here is the green dot, which that neural pattern that he's able to generate is directing the cursor um, to the correct position on the screen. 
So just by generating a certain pattern of activity, the computer has been able to associate that with certain directions. Now, this is one step in the process in terms of getting a signal generated with the appropriate response in, in uh, the computer. Another step in that process is then taking that signal and associating it with certain movements in a prosthetic limb. So here, what we'll see is the same individual And so now associating those cursor movements with certain movements of a prosthetic limb is going to allow him to more effectively interact with the environment, where it's just one step in that process. So I hope over the course of the semester, we will be able to talk about the communication systems within the central nervous system. Uh, I'll help you learn about them, talk about this idea of learning, how learning occurs in the central nervous system, what processes that involve, and then what happens, what prevents repair after certain types of brain damage, and what are the strategies to try to repair the central nervous system. So that's the goal. But before we can get into that, I often like to have you know, at the beginning of the story, where did we see behavior and the brain uh, starting to emerge in, in the timeline uh, of, of the Earth? And what we can see is around 4,500 years ago, we have the origin of the Earth. And it's not until around uh, 3,500 years ago, we see the first single cell organisms alive, the presence of that origin of life. It's much, much later, much later, that we see the appearance of the first organisms with a simple nervous system occurring. You see here, the sea anemone, where they have a very, very simple central nervous system, basically a muscle connected to a neuron, and being able to adjust when that muscle contracts. Very, very simple. But after that point, we see that there's a rapid transition between seeing the first simple nervous systems, just basically a neural network, to the appearance of the first brains. And then we see it's been a very short time frame to the appearance of the first human brains, where they're much more complex. So. What has led to this dramatic change in this most recent time frame? Well, natural selection is an important process where the environment works to shape organisms, selecting for them organisms that have the best uh, capability to gain resources, and reproduce. And it originated with some common ancestor. So I do want to emphasize that this kind of natural selection is not going to be linear by any means. It's going to be best characterized by a shrub or a many branches that are coming off. As there's a niche or there's a certain part of the environment where the animal is able to gain certain resources as well as uh, is able to um, is able to uh, um, um, maintain those resources. Uh, what we see is that they are going to be selected for. However, if the environment changes, or there's some factor in the environment, and maybe certain organisms are able to do better than others, they'll be selected for. Um, and a good example of this natural selection, it's not per se natural, but a somewhat artificial selection, comes from breeding of dogs. And here we can see that there was some early dog wolf potential ancestor. And what's happened is that there were these selection pressures uh, that was applied by certain tasks that they wanted these dogs to be involved with, such as hunting or guarding or herding uh, or even being more domesticated in terms of lap dogs. 
But at some point, there was one common ancestor. And because of these selection pressures or points, we're able to see this amazing amount of variety uh, or variability from this one common ancestor. So I think this does a good job of illustrating that depending on these uh, selection pressures, uh, you can see either this kind of diversifying, or you can imagine that there may be more directional or stabilizing selection for organisms. So Charles Darwin was the one that proposed this idea of evolution as based on natural selection, this pressures from the environment coming in. And from this, he's had a legacy in the field of neuroscience, individuals trying to study brain and behavior. First, one aspect it is, is that animal neurons are all related to one another. So when we're looking at a neuron in a fruit fly, or we're looking at a neuron in a sea slug, or a dog, or a human, uh, non-human primate, they're all related. And we're going to, as we go in to this semester and we talk about neurons, we talk about um, their characteristics, we're going to see there's a surprising similarity in many characteristics of how they function we observe in sea slugs versus fruit flies versus humans. And this allows us to study or develop animal models of certain neurological diseases studying stroke or studying Alzheimer's disease or multiple sclerosis, we're able to study that in a fruit fly. And it will translate, the results that we have will translate directly to understanding the disease in humans and maybe provide better treatment outcomes. Because we see that these neurons are related, we also see that behaviors are related, that there are similar kind of behavioral responses. And we'll talk a little bit more about behavior later in this lecture. But because of this natural selection operating on the central nervous system, we see that it's also operating on the behaviors to change and shape behaviors that are adaptive and eliminate behaviors that may not be adaptive. Uh, for example, we can see that there is this process or this behavior that we can refer to as emotion, being able to show fear or being able to show uh, uh, love or affection, those kinds of emotions um, we can see across many different species. Uh, so it's not just unique to human, but behaviors also show that tendency to be selected for. Now, what we think, uh, our operating hypothesis, is that behavior in brains are changed gradually from simpler uh, to more complex kinds of processes. So there are small changes that occur because of environmental conditions. And that's changes both in the central nervous system as well as in the associated behaviors. So how do we, from this, and we can see from our example with breeding of dogs, there's an amazing amount of diversity. So how do we try to relate this or organize this? Well, biologists use a term uh, uh, taxonomy or the taxonomy of life to organize the variability across all these different um, animal, um, all these different um, living organisms. And what we'll see is that at each different level, we can gain insight to how uh, behavior and brain have gradually changed to increase the complexity in which we interact with the world. And first, let's look across the kingdoms of living organisms. Remember, we have Monaria, Protista, Planetary Fungi, and animal, animals. And what we see is that animals are the only organism that have brain cells and muscles. All these other kingdoms don't possess that characteristic. So the animal kingdom is unique in that regard of having brain and muscle uh, um, in, in terms of a evolutionary advantage. An animal that's able to control when it moves based on certain conditions is going to have certain adaptive value over other organisms that cannot. 
Now, if we move down and look across animal phyla, here's where we get to see an interesting change in the structure of the central of the nervous system of an organism. On the far left here, we see a nerve net. These are very simple, simple um, nervous systems where we basically have a network of neurons and they are able to control when the muscles contract and when they don't contract. With this, the sea anemone is able to generate a current and that current is able to pull water in and then allow them to kind of uh, feed off the nutrients in the water. I often like to think about this as uh, with the nerve net, you're basically able to sit on the couch, reach into the cushion and throw whatever's in the cushion, chips, pretzels, Doritos, whatever, up in the air. And if you have your mouth open, you're able to then uh, eat those nutrients. It's not very sophisticated, but because you're able to generate that current, now you're able to get resources that you weren't able to before. Now moving just to the right, we see now we have a segmented nerve or trunk. And this bilateral symmetry allows the flatworm or other worms to start to move through the environment. So now you're able to move uh, through the environment. Instead of being stationary, <clears throat> you can coordinate these movements so you're able to generate a wave through the body and move through water or mud or dirt and obtain resources that previously weren't available to you. So that movement is a huge advance in terms of being able to get resources. So if you eat up all of the Doritos there on the couch, uh, <coughs> now you're able to move around to another chair or another couch uh, to continue to do that, uh, um, trying to retrieve those resources. Now, moving one more step to the right across this animal phylum, we see we get ganglia. Now, these are structures uh, that are somewhat similar, but they're not a brain. The collections of neurons that allow for simple kinds of responses to organ um, to certain environmental conditions, uh, being able to maybe store memories a little bit, being able to uh, make movements when certain conditions apply, being able to process sensory information from the environment. So now we're starting to see some of these more complex sensory motor function emerging, like you can think of what a squid can engage with. So these ganglia are really a, um, a, uh, an advance over just this bilateral symmetry of the central nervous system. Now you can start to store some information. Now you can start to react, have reflexes, and react to environmental conditions. The farthest right, what we see uh, with our frog is that we get the formation of a true brain, a true collection of neurons or ganglia all together where we get a higher degree of complexity of interacting with our environment. Being able to aim and uh, retrieve a fly from the air. So it's a much more sophisticated kind of movement dependent on uh, certain conditions in the environment. So that change in the central nervous system is associated with changes in behavior. We can see further changes in behavioral complexity if we look across the classes of chordates, where we see in general, as we move from the left uh, to the right, and I do say in general because there's a several uh, exceptions here, but there's more degree of control of the limbs that the organism has. There's a higher degree of precision of coordination moving from the left in terms of um, species over here on the left. And then as we go across to the right, we see that there's a higher degree of precision of control of the movements associated with the limbs. Now, as we look across our members of the primate order, and one of the things that we see that changes is the social structure. So in terms of far left, looking at lemurs or um, New World monkeys, we see that they have weaker social structures. But as we start to move further right, we see the social structures become more stronger and become uh, more influential. And now organisms are able to attain far more resources than they were before from the environment because they're depending 
on those social structures. So again, there's a change in the brain of the central nervous of the organism, as well as a change in the behavior that we're observing. So in terms of trying to relate this to human evolution, uh, there continues to be a search for a common ancestor. We know in the fossil record there's a lot of related um, uh, organisms that we did not directly evolve from. But at some point we think that if we go back far enough, we're going to find that common ancestor. And uh, so what we're looking for is structural similarity uh, that would we could infer some behavioral complexity from that organism. As of yet, we don't have that common ancestor. Uh, what we see, um, there are some relatives such as the Australopithecus genus, uh, and we can see that their, their fossil record shows a dramatically different kind of bone structure in the skull um, in terms of this evolutionary process we see. Uh, the farthest left here is um, Australopithecus afarnus, and we can see that they have this kind of uh, dramatic change and difference in the structure of their skull uh, relative to what we see over here with a homo sapien skull. Now as we move over we can see uh, Australopithecus robustus. This is another um, species that we see in the fossil record. Again, we didn't directly descend from them, but we see there is this relationship where they're very similar to us and distinct from other primates. And then Australopithecus africanus here uh, that looks very sim more similar, but again, we didn't directly evolve from them. Now, if we move over to um, uh, our Homo sapiens, uh, that's the comparison. We also see in the fossil record organisms that we think that we may have also evolved from. And we can see a higher degree of similarity in their strong skull structure here with Homo habilis uh, over here on the left, Homo erectus here, and then Homo neanderthalinus here, and then again, here's our Homo sapiens. So we can already see in terms of human evolution, uh, there's a great deal of variety and complexity. And how do we characterize that complexity of behavior? How do we characterize the structure? Um, so how do we make these inferences? And one of the things that we can do is use the size of the skull or the cranial cavity and see whether it arranges uh, for any kind of relationship to the type of tools that they used. And here is a graph that looks at that relationship. So here's some inferred common ancestor. And here's Australopithecus africanus. And we can see that he had a much smaller um, brain size. And in those fossil sites, we didn't see evidence of any strong tool use. However, if we go to Homo habilis, we start to see the purposeful use of certain tools where they were chippy. Now, they weren't very sophisticated tools, but it was evidence that they had purposefully chipped or uh, um, modified rocks to use them in a certain way. The, the local area was filled with stones that had been shaped, purposefully shaped. Now, as that brain size continued to increase, what we see is there was a change in the quality of the tools that were made. Where Homo erectus, there is a definite increase in being able to get that point. And there is some refinement and motor control necessary for that. And we see that there is an increase in cranial capacity up to this point where we see Homo neanderthalinus and nice tools that were better and they have this larger cranial cavity. Here we see that Homo sapiens, if we look back further uh, or uh, look back at their, their brain size, we see a uh, very nice shaped tools that they were able to use and uh, this brain size. Now, 
one of the things that we have to be kind of careful about in terms of um, this this relationship is that brain size also varies with a the body of the organism. So if we're just purely looking at size of the brain, you might say, well, an elephant or a whale should have the most behavioral complexity, most sophisticated tools that uh, any organism out there uh, because they have the largest brain. But we can't do that. We actually have to look at the relationship between the organism's body size, how big their body is, relative to the brain weight. And so this graph plots that relationship. And you can see a very nice direct linear relationship, a positive correlation, where a smaller body size, such as a bat, is going to have a smaller, so here on the x-axis is body weight in kilograms. Here on the y-axis is brain weight in grams. And what we can see is if you have a smaller body, you tend to have a smaller brain. If you have a larger body, like an elephant, you're going to have a larger brain. So there's that relationship between the size of the organism, blue whale, elephant, and the brain size. Now, if we fit a line to this uh, relationship, then what we can do is measure the distance each organism is off of that line. For example, we can see a wolf lies above the line, whereas a lion lies below the line. And we can take that distance that the point is from that line and use that to talk about how much extra brain does the organism have relative to the, its body size. So if you're right on the line, such as a cat is, that means it has about as much brain tissue as expected from its body size. Whereas if it's below the line a little bit, it has a little less brain tissue than would be expected from its body size. And what you'll notice here is that Homo sapiens we're the farthest point away from that line. So we have far more brain tissue than what we should, given the size of our bodies. So again, Homo sapiens fall a dramatic um, distance away from that line. Um, we see dolphins also fall off of that line. Australopithecus, they're above the line, but they're not as high as Homo sapiens. And so we can use this encephalization quotient, which is basically the distance away from this line of best fit, to start to look at how does this relate to different organisms. Well, and I like this graph because I think it takes the data. It's looking again at those encephalization quotients. And it takes those in consideration to our different primate lineage versus other familiar animals. And what we can see is there's this dramatic change where we see dolphins fare fairly well. They're almost very similar to Homo erectus, but still Homo sapiens are further off of that line uh, or have much larger encephalization quotients. The question is then, what led to this, or um, what contributed? Why did the brains get so big relative to their body size for this human or primate lineage? Why did the brain get so big? Um, and so one of the things uh, that has been advanced is this idea of punctuated evolution, that there were certain dramatic changes in the environment that selected for certain organisms over others, and those were a organisms were able to um, gain resources that the other organisms were not able to gain. And so there was these punctuated events in the history of the Earth that led to certain selection pressures and allowed for certain organisms to um, certain organisms to thrive was other organisms did not, uh, or there wasn't that selection pressure that was applied. That led to this dramatic change, for example, what we see with some potential common ancestor similar to Australopithecus, 
to what we see with Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and then Homo sapiens. And if we look back at the fossil record and geological record of the Earth, we can see that there are certain climate change events that were associated with these different organisms in our fossil record. So there could have been these punctuated, acute, sudden events that dramatically changed our climate that selected for organisms that could engage in more complex behavior as well as have more sophisticated neural machinery. And that's the why this, this could have happened. So let's talk about three of these changes that occurred in Africa. Um, the first occurred around 8 million years ago, where we had the formation of the Great Rift Valley. Uh, here we see uh, Africa, and prior to the Great Rift Valley, there was this dramatic wet region here north, near the equator, where uh, there was a lot of lush tropical rainforest. After the formation of the Great Rift Valley, everything to the west here remained a wet jungle. Everything to the east became dramatically more dry. Um, and if we look at the fossil record, the diversity of organisms, uh, what we see is in the western side here, there's not that much diversity there. They're actually quite similar. There's not a lot of change historically. The species that were there, uh, 8 million years ago are largely unchanged. There's some lots of changes, but there isn't a great amount of diversity. There's limited fossil diversity. However, on this eastern side, uh, uh, what we see is there's a great amount of diversity, change occurring in that fossil record. And with the formation of the Great Rift Valley, that's where we, 8 million years ago, first see the appearance of Australopithecus in the fossil record. Now, two million years ago, we see that Africa became even drier on this uh, eastern side. So there was a drying, and that led to a thinning out of trees, the formation of these large open grasslands or savannas, and large herds of animals now started to appear in this uh, eastern side uh, of Africa. And with that, we see the appearance of Homo habilis. So with that uh, two million years ago, that climate change, we start to see this Homo habilis is able to walk upright and is able to use tools and maybe potentially working a little bit more in groups and being able to take down uh, animals and gain those resources from those herds. Around 1.5 million years ago, we see that the Earth starts to cool uh, a great deal, and now water starts to get tra trapped in these glaciers, and that lowers the ocean levels, and now what we see is that certain land bridges open up, and this is where we see, again, another uh, change in the fossil record where we start to see Homo erectus occurring, uh, and is able to walk out of uh, Africa and start to make it across to different continents. Um, on Earth. And so we see that there are three major climate changes. One is this great tectonic event that forms uh, the Great Rift Valley that changes the uh, eastern side of Africa to a dry savanna. That's associated with the formation, with the, in the fossil record, the occurrence of Australopithecus. Two million years ago, we see that Africa becomes even drier, and there's these savannas, and there are fewer trees, more herds. And we see that's associated with uh, Homo habilis. And then 1.5 million years ago, we see that there's uh, a cooling in the earth, water gets trapped within these glaciers, and we see that organisms start to walk uh, and start to move out of that area. And that's where we see the, in the fossil record the occurrence of Homo erectus. So this is possibly the why of this punctuated evolution but this is where people start to make speculations and argue for uh, and try to understand, well, how did the brains get so big? How do we see that change in encephalization quotient? What are factors that are keeping the brains the size that they were? And, and what were some processes or factors that influenced them? And we'll talk about three pot potential theories of how the brain got so big. And the first 
is basically different lifestyles uh, foster different types of uh, brain enlargement. Depending on what kinds of behaviors um, an animal engages in, an animal uh, is able to obtain certain resources, we might expect that those would supply the um, the energy consumption needs of a larger central nervous system. So these ideas that a lifestyle uh, of an organism may determine, may influence uh, the size of the brain. And so a good example of trying to look at lifestyle um, is looking at different organisms and their natural habitat. And what we, what researchers have done is looked at, for example, spider monkeys who obtain a large portion of their diet from fruit versus howler monkeys who obtain a relatively smaller portion of their diet from fruit. Um, mostly, howler monkeys are uh, able to eat leaves and occasionally they'll eat fruit, but we can see spider monkeys uh, are close to 75 percent, 70 percent of their diet comes from fruit, where less than half of the howler monkeys come from fruit. So what does that mean? Let's, let's try to break this down behaviorally. What does it mean if you're trying to get your diet from fruit? Take a moment and try to think about that. What are some behaviors you would need if you were getting your diet from fruit versus if you were just picking leaves and eating them? What are some things you would be aware of? What are some what are some uh, issues that you would encounter? So you're out there, you're in the jungle, and uh, you know, you have these howler monkeys that are just reaching over and pulling leaves off and eating them versus a spider monkey he is going to be getting a lot of the resources uh, from fruit. What are some issues? One issue would be maybe seasonality. Um, this idea that a um, certain fruit is only in a certain season, so you might need to keep that in mind. You might need to remember that and know the location. Oh, these trees only are available in spring, or these trees are only available in this other season. Um, another issue is, can we eat all fruit on your walk uh, home or around the house or, uh, or around the community? And you see some berries, do you just automatically eat them? Well, no, some berries may be poisonous. And so uh, learning about the color of the berry may be very important and having a, a visual system that can account for that. Um, is it easy to eat all fruit? For example, coconut or um, uh, 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 an orange? Do you just bite into an orange? You need some manual dexterity to control and interact with that. Whereas at least you just pick it off and you put it in your mouth and you start eating. So there are a lot of sensory, motor, as well as memory components to maintaining that lifestyle uh, of that. But with it, now you get more energy. You get better resources. And you'll need that to supply that growing central nervous system. Now, given these uh, spider monkey and howler monkey both weigh the same amount, and we see we're arguing that the spider monkey uh, requires more behavioral complexity. So they weigh the same amount. What would you expect would be the brain size of the spider monkey relative to the howler monkey? Remember, we're, we're arguing that fruit, and depending on fruit for a large portion of your diet, is going to engage more behavioral complexity, this different lifestyle, whereas the howler monkey is getting most of its resources from leaves. Now, they both weigh the same amount, so we've equated that, but what about their brain size? Well, what we see is there's almost a doubling of the brain size between the spider monkey and the howler monkey. The howler monkey has 50, their brain on average is 50 grams, whereas the spider monkey has a, a brain that weighs in around 107 grams. So that change in the lifestyle in terms of how they're re retrieving and procuring their resources from the environment uh, is translating to a much larger brain. 
for the spider monkey relative to the howler monkey. So this is evidence supporting that the lifestyle that an organism was able to engage in could promote a change in the brain size. Uh, and, and so lifestyle could be an important factor. Think about Homo um, habilis. And two million years ago, we have this drier open land. And now there's all these herds of large animals appearing. And so being able to coordinate or socialize uh, actions with other members of your species could translate to uh, being able to pull down a, a different resource. And now you have all these calories that are able to supply and enhance the um, enhance uh, members of your community's uh, ability to engage in different behaviors. So it's a it's a interaction between the lifestyle and the brain. So different lifestyles, one factor that could have led to the dramatic increase in brain size. Another factor that we see could have led to a larger brain size is a better cooling system. As uh, um, the brain increases in size, it expends a lot of energy. And like your phone, if you're doing a lot of work on your cell phone or uh, some other electronic device and you're expending a lot of energy, it starts to heat up. And that's the same thing for the brain. As you start to engage in uh, uh, a larger brain and it becomes more active, it's going to become hotter. And one of the things we know about in summer when you're out working in the yard, you have to be careful, especially if it's very hot, because your brain can't cool off as effectively as it needs to, and so you need to take breaks. And that's because you could have a heat stroke. Well, <clears throat> when we look back at um, uh, Australopithecus and compare it to Homo uh, uh, sapiens or Homo habilis, what we see is there is an interesting difference in the skull. In Australopithecus, we see that there aren't many um, holes. There aren't really any holes traveling through the skull carrying blood supply. Whereas in Homo um, hevelos, Homo erectus, we see there are many small holes for blood supply to go through. And so we think that part of the expansion comes from a better cooling system, keeping the brain cooler, uh, allowed for the expansion of the brain. And so if you uh, didn't cool off the brain, uh, organisms would heat up. Their brain would uh, uh, be susceptible to uh, heat stroke. And so by developing a better cooling system is another development avenue uh, piece of technology that was potentially selected for that would now, instead of being limited to a certain size of the brain, now the brain was able to expand and become much larger and allow for the dis uh, uh, taking the heat and dissipating that across the skull more effectively. Uh, and so that's one other kind of factor that could have clamped or limited the enlargement of the central nervous system that now we see is allowing it because we're able to cool the brain better, now the brain can expand to be much larger. Now, one last potential factor that could have uh, led to the development of, uh, of the larger brain size and across uh, <clears throat> time is the, the idea that development unfolds uh, at a certain rate. The development of an organism folds at a certain rate. And the acne is this idea that you can slow down development. Uh, you can slow down uh, how quickly the brain or the body develops. And with that, what we see is that there are certain advantages and there are certain disadvantages. So playing with the developmental sequence of an organism could allow for a much larger brain. And with it, a larger brain means more complex behavior in adulthood. But that means that there's a longer developmental period where the organism is not going to be able to take care of itself. And now it's going to have to depend more on its parents um, in order to gain resources, be protected from the environment. And so here what we see is a uh, 
graph of a chimpanzee fetus and a human fetus. And what we see is in adulthood, there is a dramatic change that occurs from what we see here. If we take these points and then plot them where they're at in adulthood, we can see that there's a far larger change in the chimpanzee adult relative to what we see going from human uh, fetus to the human adult. And so that's, we've, this is one dimension where we can select for this developmental sequence and slow it down. And if you have a slower developmental sequence, that means that you can allow for the brains to get even larger and more complex, allowing for more complex behavior uh, um, that will uh, uh, give these organisms a better advantage, maybe working in groups, having language, a communication system that allows one group to communicate to another group more effectively about a diverse array of information. Uh, so slowing development uh, of the organism, or neoteny, is another dimension that this could uh, have selected for uh, or allowed for the size of the brain to get much larger. The costs are you're going to have to require more parental investment in the organism because this individual is going to be a little bit less prepared for the world, uh, but the benefits is that now you have a more complex organism that has a much larger central nervous system. So given this evolution uh, of behavior and uh, brain, we want to understand how can we link these two together. And this is a topic that we'll return to throughout the semester, is how do we link behavior to brain? And what we want to do is take a moment here to discuss what is what is behavior? And we can talk about two general types of behavior. One is innate behaviors. And these are behaviors that are generally uh, inherited from previous generations. Uh, for example, a spider spinning a web is a great example of an innate behavior. That if we were to isolate this organism from an early age and then allow them to spin a web uh, so it couldn't learn from another organism, uh, we could see they would still be able to do it. Uh, certain other types of innate behaviors, uh, such as uh, um, smiling when one's happy, making that kind of emotion, uh, those are not learned. They are innate, programmed kind of behaviors, showing that there's a great theme that across many cultures, when you're happy, people will make a smile. Uh, when you're sad, people will make another facial expression. These are examples of innate behaviors. They're programmed, they're not very flexible, they're super adaptive and being able to get at some of the core things, such as in the spider spinning the web, uh, we see that that is able to uh, get the food, but they're not very flexible. In addition to innate behaviors, we see animals have learned behaviors, behaviors that are incredibly flexible, can change within a generation. And so these learned behaviors, such as like we see down here, learning about using tools to get certain resources, those are very flexible and also very important for uh, the survival of an organism. Innate behaviors can be very important, so are learned behaviors. Uh, in, in terms of um, what we mean by behavior. And we're going to dig deeper into these as we go through the semester, but it's a good idea to unpack this just a little bit by what we mean by behavior and dissociating innate versus learned. So then how do we relate these to the brain? And really we can talk about the central nervous system as being composed of the brain and the spinal cord. So over here in this diagram, we have the brain uh, and then the spinal cord uh, located here. And then we have the peripheral nervous system that refers to everything else outside of the central nervous system. Uh, sensory connections on the skin, motor connections to the muscles, sensory and motor connections to internal body organs. This is all the peripheral nervous system. And all this works together uh, to help us uh, process information, uh, maintain memories, and guide movement. Um, 
So these two work together. Historically, people have had different ideas of trying to relate brain to behavior. And this has led to a debate that I, I want to convey to you that really hasn't been resolved um, a great deal. But I think it's important to see the two different sides and where modern neuroscience comes down on this, uh, some of the basic assumptions. But this debate hasn't really been resolved. So one view uh, developed by Descartes was this idea of dualism. That, um, and I should give you a little historical context. Descartes was part of this Renaissance era um, in Europe where people were getting a renewed excitement for investigation into uh, the world around them, scientific inquiry. And so people were very excited to try to understand what was happening and explain things using the scientific method. Uh, they were inventors. There were people uh, that were thinkers and really investigators, these scientists. Also at the time, though, uh, religion was still a very powerful force in culture. And um, challenging the power of religion could still get people imprisoned. Uh, so you have this very important force uh, in the culture of religion, but you also have this equally powerful social movement of the Renaissance, renewed interest in the scientific inquiry. And Descartes was interested in trying to explain human behavior. But one of the problems um, or issues at the time was that if you were to explain too much of human behavior, it would start to erode this idea that we may have free will and that we make choices. And those choices have consequences for our, our, um, our, our life and, and the view of the church. Um, so Descartes came up with this idea or this theory of the relationship between brain and behavior that he referred to as dualism. And Dualism is that there are two components. There is the mind, which is a non-material entity or soul of the organism, that is, because it's a non-material entity, we cannot develop laws or rules to explain how it's organized. So it's beyond the scope of scientific inquiry. We cannot investigate that. That's the realm of religion. That's the realm uh, uh, outside of science. In contrast, he argued that there is another compo uh, component of this, and that's the body. That's the material entity. That is a very reflexive organ. Uh, um, and we can actually start to investigate that, try to understand that, imply scientific inquiry. So the mind, the non-material entity, is involved in uh, making choices. Whereas simple reflexes, such as getting your foot close to a fire and immediately pulling it away, is an example of the body, and we can study that. He also talked about being able to detect uh, a coin in your pocket by the impression it puts on your hand, and that's an example of the body. You can study that and understand it. But whether you decide to uh, enroll in school or you decide to commit a crime, that itself is outside the realm of scientific inquiry. That's the responsibility of the mind, this non-material entity. Now, obviously, we have to have some connection between this mind and the body to allow for, I choose to enroll into school. Well, how do I get to school? I have to walk, and how do I walk? Well, that's part of the body. He argued that the interaction was at the pineal gland. And here we have a, a sagittal section of the central nervous system. Here's the corpus callosum. Here's the cortex. We'll talk more about these structures in the next uh, lecture. But here's the pineal gland. It's a structure that's found on the midline of the central nervous system. And he argued that the mind interacts with the pineal gland. Uh, that's the body. And it allows for us to direct our actions uh, so if we're going to commit a crime or we're not going to commit a crime, it's all through the interaction at the pineal gland 
right here. Um, so there are several problems with this idea of dualism. Um, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. But I want to emphasize this now let people interested in behavior to start studying it. So while it seems hindsight kind of there, there are some problems, we'll talk about them, this did open up the window for people to start to understand and explain behavior, starting to investigate human behavior. It was simple behaviors, very reflexive, but it was a, an important step uh, in, in time. Now, there are a couple of problems with dualism. First of all, damage to the pineal gland does not change uh, behavior to where you're no longer able to tell right from wrong. Uh, so that's that's clearly uh, one of the problems there. Um, one of the more significant challenges I view to dualism is that a non-material entity interacting with a material entity requires the creation of energy. And one of the things we know from uh, the natural sciences is that energy is neither created nor destroyed, it's only transferred. So to have a non-material entity such as the mind to come in, influence, change the function of the pineal gland, like Descartes uh, posited, then you need the creation of some type of energy. And we know energy cannot be created. So this, uh, this is a significant flaw of Descartes' dualism. Uh, so first, damage to the pineal gland doesn't allow for that. And we know that you can't have a non-material entity uh, interact with a material enti entity because that requires the creation of uh, energy. In response to dualism, uh, there was advanced this idea of materialism or monism. So I refer to this as monism, the idea that all behavior emerges from the central nervous system. And by the central nervous system, we can kind of think of this in the in a light of the evolutionary history and developmental history of that central nervous system. So monism uh, is this view advanced by Hobbes that the brain is responsible for all behavior. Um, it's a physical system, uh, the brain is, and it produces, is responsible for behavior. So if we could understand that physical behavior, we could start to predict uh, or develop a set of laws to predict behavior. And that is what modern neuroscience is based on. Better understanding of the central nervous system results in a, uh, a better ability to predict behavior and function in the central nervous system. Um, this, this has its, its, uh, its its basis in, in a lot of aspects. And over the course of the semester, we're going to see that modern neuroscience really is based on this idea. It also conflicts or has a, a challenge with our culture. A good example of that is that our modern legal system assumes that people have free will. And when they commit a crime, they can be punished by that, that for that crime. And so monism doesn't leave opportunity for free will. Uh, it's, the, it's your evolutionary developmental history that leads to this certain point in time. Now, admittedly, we can't predict all aspects, all dimensions of behavior currently. <clears throat> and, um, but behavior, at some, some point, we may be able to predict all aspects of behavior. And if we can, that leaves open the question of do we have free will? Free will is a strong uh, phenomenological experience. You have the feeling that you decided to uh, attend this lecture today through Blackboard. You decided to brush your teeth this morning. Um, all these phenomena uh, have the sense of you making the choice. So both phenomenologically as well as culturally, we depend on that free will and whether someone decides or not. But it's just illustrating this little bit of contrast between modern neuroscience and what I think we experience phenomenologically and uh, culturally, this idea of free will that's more consistent with dualism. 
However, we see dualism itself um, has some real limitations, that there really isn't an opportunity for this non-material entity to interact with a material entity. So you should take some time to think about these two views, monism or materialism versus dualism. And this idea, the ideas, the assumptions of each, and the problems associated with each. These problems with monism uh, have actually been so significant that several interesting developments in the legal system where the training of lawyers have occurred, where they have neural legal departments now, looking at our ability to use certain imaging techniques in the court of law to decide whether someone has lied or not, uh, trying to decide whether or not someone is capable to stand, uh, uh, stand trial for something. So this Monism and neuroscience, as we continue to advance our understanding of the function of the central nervous system and its relationship to behavior, can change or influence our, our, our legal system and our culture in significant ways. So it's something to think about and to consider the, the benefits or the costs of each uh, of, uh, of those different views or the problems associated with the views. So this concludes our first uh, chapter here, uh, chapter one. Uh, again, we talked about the evolution of uh, organisms, talking about some of the factors that influence that. We talked about human evolution, uh, talking about uh, uh, the reasons or the um, uh, why did the brain get so large, uh, talk about those changes in climate. And then we talked about some mechanisms of how it could have gotten so big in terms of looking at uh, the different lifestyle, a bit of cooling system, and the acne. And then we tried to link brain and behavior, and we considered these two different views, monism and dualism. So our next uh, lecture will be about the neuroanatomy of the central nervous system. Uh, you will definitely want to uh, review your book and uh, uh, review these slides. And uh, after you've had a time to do that with this chapter, then feel free to attempt the lecture quiz and the practice exam for this chapter. This is still all part of Unit 1. Have a good day, and we'll see you next time.